In this video, you're going to see your first neural network, um, but this isn't entirely true because if you've actually followed along um, with some of my other videos, then you've looked at logistic regression with basis functions. And what I will show you in this video is that you can actually write logistic regression with basis functions as a neural network. Um, and in the video, we'll then start to basically generalize that idea a little bit so that we can start to understand feed forward neural networks. So just very briefly again, um, binary logistic regression, um, we do by using a sigmoid function where we take some input and then basically take the dot product of that input with respect um, to some weight um, w. And if we're using basis functions instead of using the original x, we replace that x with, with some um, maybe phi of x. Um, some set of basis functions, maybe the square of some of them, maybe you take the log of some of the elements of x and you plug that in. So let's see how, see how we can actually write that as a neural network. So here we're going to um, just briefly look at the example again of classifying irises and we're specifically going to do binary classification and you've seen this data set before it's a kind of standard and um, famous data set so um, we've got an iris and the iris has a petal which is this kind of side leaf and that has a width and a length and then it has this bigger leaf um, which I think is called the sepal and the sepal has a length and a width as well. And if you've got these length and width measurements um, and you kind of plot them, then we can try and say, okay, cool, well, what type of iris is this based on its petal uh, length and width, maybe, if those are your two input features. So for classifying whether something is an iris virginica or not, we can measure the petal length and the petal width. And, um, and then each of these little dots here would be a measurement from some specific flower. And here we've got all our iris virginicas. And here we've got a bunch of flowers that were labeled as not iris virginica. And then we could say, okay, well, let's build just on these original features, on these original um, X features. Let's build a binary, um, binary logistic regression classifier to say whether something is an iris virginica or not. Okay. And if you actually do this, if you um, define a standard binary logistic regression model taking X as input and we um, run gradient descent on that weight vector, then what we get out is a um, decision boundary looking like this. So we see that this decision boundary very clearly um, separates the iris virginicas from the not iris virginicas, which is exactly what we want. But now let's look at a slightly more intricate example. Let's say we want to classify iris versicolors and we want to separate them out from not iris versicolors, other types of irises. Now, if we now measure the petal length and petal width in this case, then you will see that um, it's actually quite difficult because it's not obvious how you would um, use a linear classifier where you would put the boundary in order to separate out these irises from the others. So if we run binary logistic regression, again taking x as the input to that model, then the result we get is the following. And so it's clear that this like classifier, I mean, it's doing its best. It's kind of trying to figure out what the fudge to do here. Um, and it's put the boundary kind of um, somewhere like somewhat arbitrary because it's impossible to really separate out these iris versicolors from the not iris versicolors by just using a, a linear boundary. So what can we do instead? If you only know about binary logistic regression, then we can add some basis functions. So instead of taking x as the input to our model, we're going to use a phi of x, which is some transformation that we define by hand for now. So here's one that I come, came up with, and I will write down the phi of x in a second. Um, and the decision boundary looks like this. Okay, so this is really neat, because now what we have is we've got a decision boundary that separates out the iris versicolors from the not iris versicolors. And in this specific case, the basis functions that I used um, was basically, let me just make sure here, I had a 1 and a x1 and a x2. That's the standard... Um, a linear one and then I took the square of x1 and the square of x2 as well and I just added those as additional features to my model. 
okay and now instead of of having a model uh, f w x where we take the dot product of w transpose and um, x instead of doing that now we've got a phi of x that we've set in here and of course this is binary logistic regression so that whole thing is pushed through a sigmoid to get outputs between zero and one and followed exactly the same steps as with um, standard binary logistic regression but i just added these two features into this model here so what i will do now is i will actually convince you that this model here with um, basis functions here is kind of like a neural network the one thing that's different in a neural network is that instead of constructing this by hand where i added this x1 square and x2 squared here by hand instead of doing that a neural network basically comes up with the basis functions on its own we define a loose structure for the basis functions um, but then we basically learn the parameters of these basis functions this will become clear in in just a second so let's first just formally write out logistic regression with basis functions and then draw a little a little picture to illustrate what's going on so for logistic regression with basis function, we have the output of our model. Um, we're just going to look at binary classification, but you can easily extend it to multi-class classification as well. But for now, it's just binary classification. And for binary classification, if we're using basis function, we've got our weight transpose and then our uh, basis function vector there. Okay, so let's just draw out a picture of this. What we have is at the output side of our model, we've got just the output, and I'm just going to note, note that as F. Now for getting F, the output um, of our model, we've got our little basis functions that goes in here. So we've got our first, um, the first value of our basis function, phi one of X, phi two of X, and so on, up until phi capital K of x okay and all of these things go into f in order to you basically take the dot product of that with all the different parameters and all of that goes into f okay perfect um just for dealing with neural networks it's often actually easier to explicitly denote the bias term here right normally we have this little hack where we put a, a one in this first element and then we don't have to deal with the bias. But for neural networks, it's often convenient to explicitly include that bias term. So I'm just going to add a little plus one here. And then that goes in there. And let's already add this. So this would just be our little bias. So phi one of x, the first element um, in our basis function vector, that's based on our input. So that's based on x1 and x2 and so on up to xd okay so this first value here is based on all of these okay um, and again i'm just going to add a little plus one here which is just our bias that we incorporate there and that will become clear in a second the second element of our basis function is again based on x1 and on x2 and on x3 and 4 and 5 up to xd and so is our last basis function dunk, dunk, dunk. now if you've seen pictures of neural networks before then um, this is starting to look um, suspicious because it's actually starting to look like a neural network now, if you looked at my previous example, that previous slide, I defined these phi 1, phi 2, and phi k by hand. I decided, oh, I want an x1 squared and an x2 squared. But with neural networks, we can set these basis functions so that they are learned. Okay, We're going to define their structure, but we're going to give them parameters which we will update as part of the model. So specifically, what we can do is we can set the little kth basis function, phi of little k of x. We can set that now, we've got a few decisions what we can use here, but um, let me do one example, which is we set this to the sigmoid of some weight vector, okay? And I take the transpose of that, x plus, and then b 
little k. So what we do is we've got a little unit here, little k, and that unit has its own weight vector, w little k. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the dot product of w little k with x, my input, and then I'm going to add a bias term, which is also specific for that unit. And that will then be the output of um, that element of my basis function vector. Now, what I did before was I set this basis function thing by hand, but now we've got little parameters, w little k and b little k, that we are going to learn. And that's what makes this a neural network. Here, what we did specifically was I used the sigmoid here, but you actually have a few different decisions that you can make. For the general case, we will have um, phi little k x is equal to g, where g is some nonlinearity. And then we've got our weight vector transpose x plus, and then our bias term b k. And it's important that g should be some nonlinear function. Um, it, it should um, it should be a nonlinear function because if it's just a linear function, then you can actually this whole thing then collapses to just um, normal linear and um, linear logistic regression. And common choices for for g is um, you've seen some of these before is the sigmoid. I will draw that out in a second. Tan h, um, and I'll draw that out in a second. And then the one that's very often used these days, which is a rectified linear units. So just pretend for a second that those lines are all straight. Then the sigmoid basically at minus infinity, we're very close to zero. It increases, it hits 0 0.5 there, and then it flattens out again, and it kind of stabilizes at, at one. Okay, so it always has a, ver a value between zero and one. The tan h is very similar, but it goes from minus one and then up, and then it goes, it flattens out at one again. And then the ReLU, uh, it looks very simple. Um, that's maybe why people like it so much, but, but, and it also turns out to work really well. It's just zero, 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 and then just a straight line up with a gradient of one. And that's the ReLU. There are some good reasons that the ReLU actually addresses some of the issues that you sometimes have with sigmoid or tan h. But all three of these are often used and it um, often also depends on what the function is of that specific um, um, little intermediate output. Sometimes you actually want the outputs in your neural network to be between 0 and 1 and then you will use a sigmoid or sometimes you want them to be between minus 1 and 1 and then a tan h is, is useful but very often in practice these days a ReLU is actually used. Okay so now you've actually seen your first neural network um, and but it's important to emphasize you've probably seen one already if you've if you've done logistic regression with basis function. The only difference here is that like my little basis functions here will actually be learned um, um, by the model. I just want to scribble on this um, figure here some of the parameters in and let's do it in blue. So here at the output, um, also to get some of the notation right, what we would have is for our output, we would have some bias term, and here in this um, like middle layer, we will also have a bias term. So let's just call the, the output layer, let's just call that layer 2. So I'm already talking about layers, right? So you've, you can kind of see you've got layers here, and you can actually stack more of them um, on top of each other. But let's just call the final layer, layer 2. So then we've got a bias term here, but that bias term belongs to layer 2. Um, we've got a little w1 here, but w1 belongs to layer 2. Here we've got a little w2 that belongs to layer 2. Here we've got a little w, what is this, capital K, also belonging to layer 2. And then for our first layer here, here we also have a, um, uh, uh, a bias term, okay? But we actually, it's actually a little bias, you can think of it as a bias vector, but here we've got um, b, one, so for that's for our first basis function, and this is in layer one. Here we've got B2, this, that's also in layer one. Here we've got B3, also in layer one, and so on up to um, B capital K. Okay, and then associated with each of these units, we will also have little weights, and maybe I shouldn't try and draw all of them in. Let's just, so let's just look at this last unit here, 
here we're going to take the dot product of x with some weight that's specific to this unit and we will call that vector w capital k and this is in layer one okay and so this this vector here that's basically the dot product over all of um, all of the x's coming in and that's how you get um, uh, the capital k -th, um, basis function value there or, or neuron if you want to call it that you get that value here now you can see that this diagram is getting quite bloated and kind of quite complicated so you will see that neural networks are often represented in different ways um, you sometimes have a little diagram like this which explicitly shows um, what you can think of as the um, neurons in the middle but you can also use something that's um, like a vector diagram that would look like this so in vector form, what you would have here is you would have right at the bottom your input, which is just vector x, okay? And then you get, let's start calling this the activations from my, um, from my first hidden layer. So this is layer one, okay? And in this case, this would be just be my nonlinearity times a weight matrix, for layer one now this weight matrix is just all the little um, individual vectors that we've stacked up here times x plus and now instead of a scalar i actually have a vector b1 so what this equation does is it basically just tells you immediately how to get out this whole vector here given this vector x here at the bottom okay and then the output of our model f, uh, f let's write um theta here i know i wrote a uh, a w here but now I'll, I'll define theta in a second um, of my input x that would just be um, sometimes we just write y hat right the prediction of the model some nonlinearity the output vector wt uh, and w2 transpose and then as the input here I take my activations from the previous layer plus my bias term which is now a scalar because we're producing a scalar and that's the output of my model. So you can see that this is a much more condensed version describing exactly the same thing. Now the crucial thing here is that we've got a whole bunch of parameters, right? So um, and that's why I wrote the theta there is because you can think of, of theta as consisting in this case of a whole bunch of things. We've got in our first layer, we've got this W1 matrix We've got our bias vector in the first layer. And then in the output, we've got our little W2 vector and our W, uh, our um, second bias term. Now, and I've said this a few times now already, sorry for repeating it again. The crucial thing is that instead of specifying these basis functions by hand, we're going to learn all of these parameters, including the basis function parameters. We're going to learn that with gradient descent. And that's what makes this a neural network. So I should say here that the model that we're using here, where we've got one hidden layer here with some output layer predicting a binary value, this is really a special case of a multi-layer perceptron, or sometimes just called a feed-forward neural network. In this case, we're making a binary classification, but you can also use a multi-layer perceptron, or MLP, or a feed-forward neural network. Um, you can use that for multi-class classification as well, and the structure would look very, very similar.